will launch the last shot of the season from downtown and connect. That'll do it. The Boston Celtics move on. Wasn't this what they were trying to avoid? Transport yourself back to the early days of the process and you'll hear the same thing. They don't want to be stuck in the same hamster wheel as years past. It's why they were doing what they were doing in their relentless tank. But to see it now is merely torture. They had a brief blip of promise into something greater than what they were, but now they're just another team. Now a little disclaimer that I've done a few other vids on this team before. I've never been a fan of the process, but I was noticing they were starting to turn the corner in 2018 and for good reason. They had a potential trio that could bring them a championship and were starting to bolster the depth for postseason runs. I ended up praising Brian Colangelo for the work he had done in bridging the gap between Hinkies tanking and forging a contender. This fine take of mine did not backfire. Did not backfire. In absolutely no way blew up in my face whatsoever. I never knew something could age worse than rancid milk, and after just a few months of release, with Brian Colangelo's love for burner accounts revealed to the world, the Sixers needed to scramble to find a new GM. This new guy was headed into an interesting situation. They had two emerging talents in Embiid and Simmons, they still had some draft capital from the Hinky era, and they had depth that could make them a threat in the postseason. You maneuver well enough, you could make this team into a legit contender. To move them to the next level, they promoted Elton Brand to the role. Yes, you heard that correctly. A man who had just retired several years earlier and was only the GM for their G League team for one year. A team that finished tied for dead last in said G League. Now perhaps I'm being too harsh. The G League means absolutely nothing in terms of managerial performance and he allegedly made a strong impression in his interview with the team owners. It's not like they've made any drastic changes or mistakes in the past. And that's where I find the Sixers' main problem to lie. Their failures are not solely on Henke. They're not fully on Colangelo. They're not fully on Brand. Philadelphia's issue is that they've had three completely differing visions. Each of these three individuals have done their own thing without any sort of cohesion or gradual succession plan. Sam Henke chose to deliberately tank to secure futures. Brian Colangelo tried to mend the bridge and do whatever he did. And Dalton Brand threw all caution into the wind and decided to go all in for a championship. Regardless of if they were ready or not. This issue falls solely on ownership. There was never a set plan or outline for successors to follow. Just handing a stock portfolio to a random guy and saying, It's your call now! Have fun! Just make us money! But that's not enough to cause a cascade. As for a key point to where they fell, many will point to trading up with Boston to draft Markel Fultz. And it was. The problem with blaming it solely on this is that you couldn't predict at the time that Fultz's shoulder was going to go foobar and develop the yips. Remember, at the time of the draft, pundits and fans alike were hailing the trade as a slam dunk for the Sixers. Although foresight is impossible, his issues have been well profiled. Some say it was the pressure of being a top pick. Some say a career-threatening nerve issue. There was a diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome. Regardless of what it was, Philly was too hasty in branding him a bust. I get why, though. He was supposed to be the final piece to a great championship core. The culmination of the process. Hinky's vision finally being realized. When he flopped miserably, Brand shipped off Fultz to the Orlando Magic for mere pennies of his talent and draft pedigree. Think of how history could have changed if Fultz was as advertised. They don't trade for Jimmy Butler. They keep Sarge and Covington. Their depth is fortified by homegrown talent. They're perennial championship contenders. So it's not really a case of poor judgment, but rotten luck. It's especially since Fultz is starting to regain his old form with the Magic. I don't know if he'll be able to realize his potential, but he's at least a playable option at the time, unlike in Philly. What makes this even worse is the guy Boston drafted with the pick Philly traded to them. Jason Tatum. More on him later. Despite much optimism regarding the brand hire, it's quite obvious to see nowadays. He's nowhere near ready for a GM role. He's forcing old school techniques and practices in the modern game. It can be shown in his trades where you can make the argument that he gave up way too much for players on expiring deals. The Jimmy Butler deal wasn't as bad since they desperately needed a star perimeter player and Sarge and Covington were replaceable, but the Tobias Harris deal was a tough price to pay. Harris was one of the better players on the market, but to trade the last of the draft capital accrued by Hinky plus a promising guard in Landry Shamit? It was an all-in push. But was it truly the right call? Look at the core they're trying to push. Ben Simmons has talent, that cannot be denied. However, there is a glaring issue with his game. He either cannot or outright refuses to take jump shots. In the age of the three-pointer, this is borderline fatal, regardless of his skill with the ball. Until he can develop a jump shot, Simmons will be unable to reach his true potential. Joel Embiid is a well-rounded player, but his problem is the same one that's been laid on him since he was drafted. Durability. 
He's missed time in each season either due to injuries, rest, or a combination of the above. With those additions and a patchwork of reasonable depth, they were expected to make a serious push for the NBA championship. Unfortunately, there was a certain man that had other plans. It's off the Leonard, defended by Simmons. Is this the dagger? <laughs> That was your shot. It's a shame it was a damn good series against the Raptors, even if you didn't win the series. Not that it won't make you feel any better, but that team did end up winning the NBA title. Perhaps in a different timeline, it's the Sixers that win it all. Then we're talking a different story, about how the process was finally justified after years of derision. Philadelphia would never shut the fuck up about them, and the NBA is worse off due to teams trying to imitate their success, but that's just me. This upcoming offseason was one of the most crucial in the history of the organization. Big decisions had to be made regarding their trade acquisitions, team identity, Brett Brown, and what the future would hold for a team on the precipice of success. And the key objective for this team was clear. They had to re-sign Jimmy Buckets. His role was critical to not only ball movement, but giving the team a balanced approach. They failed. They couldn't get him to sign with the team. Butler would point to Brett Brown as the reason he wouldn't sign. If that's the case, why didn't they chuck him out? I'd say Butler was critical, much more than the coach Sixers fans wanted fired to begin with. But alas, it was not meant to be. He would be part of a sign-in trade to Miami. The Sixers would receive a downgrade in Josh Richardson. As a result of the Butler deal, Elton Brand either got delusional or outright desperate. Tobias Harris was another guy Philly wanted to sign. And they got him at a price high enough to give most basketball fans an aneurysm. Now Harris is a solid support guy, but who the hell pays that an average of $36 million per year for five years with no team options? Why do I get the feeling that they were bidding against themselves? If that were it, fine, but it gets worse. For their big free agent splash, they don't go for a position of need. They double down on net front presence with Al Horford, a bruising center formerly on arrival in his mid-30s and starting to decline. Brand threw an average of $27 million per year at him for four years. A redundant luxury good. Do you know how much luxury tax that the Sixers may end up paying in the future? As a result of these big signings, J.J. Redick, their three-point specialist, was allowed to leave in free agency. Many saw a potential champion in the making, but the Sixers became incredibly one-dimensional and bloated. All this talent is great and all, but who the hell's going to shoot threes? Embiid? Some dude from the G League? That's the question we all got to see play out in real time as the Sixers struggled immensely. Everyone said it was a failure to live up to potential, but part of me had a feeling this would play out. Once again, they were one-dimensional. Horford and Embiid can't coexist on the court together. Tobias Harris is good at 15 million per year, a total liability at 36 million per year. Ben Simmons is still allergic to jump shots. And he also has a major extension coming next season. Pretty good for being unable to take jump shots. I also have to mention that he got injured just before the playoffs and underwent knee surgery. A flawed team just became even more flawed. Which is where the Boston Celtics, also known as this team's Grim Reaper, come back into play. Do you remember Jason Tatum? He's the cornerstone of the Celtics franchise at this point in time. The 76ers are completely outplayed and outmatched at every angle. It's no surprise that they're swept, but it merely reinforces what they had become. Just another team spinning the wheels of futility. This was the fate they were trying to avoid. That's what all the years of god-awful Sixers teams were about, remember? So they wouldn't get swept by the Boston Celtics in the first round five years down the road. All those lost years full of tanking? I fear that they were for nothing. The rainbow only leads to a bottomless chasm. And it's their own damn fault for it. Over the past year, I've been thinking more and more about something. What would Sam Hinkie have done if he weren't forced out by the NBA? Would he have maintained course and trusted his vision of the process? Would he have simply done what Colangelo did and tried to build the team back up? Or would he have seen that the current core wasn't going to work and re-roll for more futures? Remember, there was a time where many people thought Joel Embiid was never going to play a game in the NBA. It's not entirely out of question. Any way you look at it, the years of tanking were all for naught at this point. The process is dead. It technically has been since Kawhi shot in Game 7, but this season sealed its fate. The Sixers fanbase doesn't get much sympathy from me. They were incredibly obnoxious during the whole affair, but even I must admit this truth. They were bamboozled. Sold nothing but snake oil to be excited for and sell tickets to an outright terrible team for years. They were given the false promise of riches beyond their wildest dreams. And all it cost them was a few years of their time and organizational credibility. Even Charles Ponzi couldn't come up with a better scheme to dupe the masses. So in the end you have a fanbase completely disillusioned with the team and demanding heads to roll. Sure, there may be some that simply think firing Brett Brown is going to bring the Sixers back to their former promise, but he's far from the only problem on this team. It goes a hell of a lot further than that. And to cure this ailment, you'll have to gut everything, including ownership and reboot the franchise again. 
Are they going to even want to retrust the process so soon after the original one? So the process of the 76ers isn't going so well. Perhaps it isn't truly dead, but it's at least on life support. This could serve as a valuable life lesson. The process didn't trust in world-class security or elite protection. They got careless and are now locked into the contract equivalent of compromised data. It may be too late for them, but we can learn from this tragedy. ExpressVPN is the tool to protect your online privacy and information. Hackers are everywhere, but with ExpressVPN, I already know I'll be secure in my online shenanigans. With this baby, I don't have to deal with attackers. It creates a seamless encrypted tunnel between whatever device I use and the great beyond of the internet. I can choose from servers in 94 countries, overcoming region blocks for content on YouTube and other sites with fast encryption on every one. And the best part of all, I only need to click once and I'm good to go. It's been a trusty asset to me, and as I've said before, a VPN is all but mandatory in this day and age. You can even get three months of ExpressVPN free with this special offer. The only way to get it is to go to expressvpn.com slash utree. Here's a process you can trust. ExpressVPN. I already do. Will you? You know, I picked the Sixers to get to the finals. I think they are the softest, mentally weakest team. It had a bunch of talent. They are the Cleveland Browns of the NBA. Damn. They, they got I, a lot of talent. The Browns? And they talk the talk, and that's it.